It's also my pleasure to introduce you to a colleague of mine. Uh, Grace Simrall is the Chief of Innovation, Civic Innovation and Technology for Louisville Metro Government. Uh, and I guess I've work, been working uh, with and around Grace for a couple of years, and she is one of those people uh, who just does things that make you wonder how they got done. Uh, so I, I Googled Grace uh, before tonight because, you know, you work with somebody and you don't really learn all the little fine nuanced details. Um, so it's kind of like you've walked tonight into an episode of Big Bang Theory, and I'm, I don't know, I guess I'm like the comic book sales guy. Um, but Grace did her undergraduate degree in geophysical sciences at the University of Chicago. Uh, and they don't have a very good basket, but they may not even have, do they even have a basketball team, Grace? <laughs> Oh, yeah, so they can't play basketball. Uh, then she did a uh, master's degree uh, at the Speed School of Engineering at the University of Louisville. Uh, she is an accomplished um, innovator. Uh, she's worked in technology and data analytics, and we are very lucky to have her here in Louisville. And so I'm going to introduce Grace Simrall, and I hope you all have a great night tonight. Thank you so much, Lee. And it is with great pleasure that I'm here to introduce Susan Crawford, who is, and I'm going to do this very carefully because uh, she is the John A. Riley, not to be confused with the John C. Riley, clinical <laughs> professor of law at Harvard Law School. She is the author of multiple books, um, but she's here tonight to speak about fiber, um, the tech revolution that, uh, and why America might miss it. Now, I think if you all, I see some familiar faces in the room, are aware Louisville Metro government has taken fiber connectivity very seriously. And in fact, in the past several years, made significant budget appropriations and commitments to build out our own municipal fiber network, middle mile fiber, which um, Susan spends quite a bit of time talking about and why governments should make that investment. Um, she's also a, a frequent Wired contributor and in fact wrote about our experiences getting that appropriation for um, a widely read Wired article. Um, if anyone has followed both uh, our announcement of becoming a Google Fiber City and also the subsequent exit, uh, again, this talk is for you. So um, without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Susan Crawford. Oh, thank you, Grace. That's very nice. I really appreciate that. Well, I couldn't be happier to be here. Thank you so much to Lee Birchfield and the library for having me. Uh, it's a delight to be introduced by Grace, who is one of the best civic servants you could ask for. It's great that she's here in Louisville. I've enjoyed today exploring Louisville. I hadn't been here before, so a great chance for me to do that. Very grateful to Burkhard Bowser and also his wife Kay for being my hosts here and to the library for bringing me around. And don't forget uh, Nick and Megan and Paul from the library who are here backing me up, making sure that this works. This is sort of a happy warrior practice speech, got to say, because I'm here to talk about Google Fiber and uh, talk about what happened and why we can learn a lot of useful lessons from that, very positive lessons for Louisville and the rest of the country. So here I go, I'm very brave. And uh, I, in the Washington Post just posted a big article that I'm gonna convey to you giving you advice that if it's too wet for humans to play baseball or for people to drive cars, maybe horses shouldn't run. Just letting you know, I'm gonna be the happy warrior about that. Uh, good timing, right? And then I hear that WrestleMania is in town, so uh, another opportunity for all of us to think through our, our fate on Earth. I'm a very unlikely um, person to be here. I come from an absolutely silent household, uh, two musicologists, composers, my parents, and I was raised to be a musician. I basically grew up in a practice room, and people didn't really talk about much. Uh, it's been an adventure for me. I went to law school because it's hard to make a living, frankly, as a musician in America. Uh, but I've always retained some of that childlike joy in connecting with people. And uh, I get to bring a lot of that to bear, this, this research that I've been doing around the country, talking to the communities that are involved in fiber, has made me a chatty person, and I now really love it. I was talking to all of your waiters and all of your bartenders and <laughs> just trying to figure out what I could glean about Louisville doing my time here. It's been a really uh, a great 10 years. My, my career started off as a young lawyer in Washington just when the internet came around, uh, the commercial internet for all of us to use. And I remember 
the very first website that I went to. I'm a native of Santa Monica, California, also unlikely for me to be from Santa Monica. And I, uh, my very first website was called The Spot, and it was a beach house uh, that people in their 20s were hanging around in. And there was a little button saying, come experience sea and sand and talk to us and press here to talk. And I remember pressing that moment, and I remember the magic. It's like the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, all the cloaks part, and you're suddenly in a different world. And only people my age and older really remember that with the ferocity that I remember. And that, that big idea that the internet enables connection among humans has never left me. And I still think, and I will continue to think until my last day, that it is the uh, defining idea of my lifetime and the, th uh, the thing that has really transformed the earth after the Gutenberg Bible, which Burkhardt brought to um, Louisville about 10 years ago, right? So thank you for that. So that was a big move, and the internet has been a big move, uh, and it's something that I continue to find transformative. I spent 10 years working on domain name policy. What's that? You know, we only had ComNet and org, and a bunch of top-level domains needed to be formed, and there's actually an international board that does that. And I, I wrote essays about it, and I tried to understand it, sort of a petri dish of governance. I actually wrote songs about it. I became a member of the board. And then 10 years after that began, uh, it was November 2008, I was in Cairo with the board, and I suddenly got a call from the Obama people, because just at that moment, Mr. Obama had been elected. And I remember watching him and his beautiful family cross the stage at Grant Park, really a <coughs> tremendously moving moment. And I, I'm not at all political. I had nothing to do with the campaign. And then I get this call in the middle of the night, come work on the FCC transition. What's up with that? Why did I get to do that? I have no idea. Uh, and that changed my life, because um, working on the transition between Bush and Obama was a moment of reinvention of the Federal Communications Commission and vaulted me into 10 years of thinking about, writing about, no songs this time, but definitely focused on internet access in America. You may or may not remember, there were about <coughs> $7 billion allocated in the Stimulus Act of 2009 uh, in grants to help uh, people build internet access in America. It was a drop in the bucket. It was nowhere near the amount of money that was needed to help the situation, but it was a chance to demonstrate pilot projects, uh, really show what was possible. When I left the administration after being kind of a tech poobah, which was weird, I, I was sitting in that role, I left and wrote a book called Captive Audience, which is all about uh, Comcast's role in America. And all the interviews for that book had to be done off the record because people were really frightened of Comcast's power. Um, and I learned a lot about what happened in American policy to get us where we are today in our particular market for internet access, which I'll talk about. Um, I then wrote about data use in government and uh, in a book called The Responsive City, and this is my third book. I'm moving on now to a fourth project, which I'm going to highlight for you at the end of this talk. And so just think, what could she do next? And, and I'll get there. Um, to my delight and amazement, meeting the characters involved in the 800 networks, fiber networks across the country has been a total thrill. It's just fun. These are courageous and interesting people. Uh, most of these networks are in Republican areas. This is a truly nonpartisan movement going on around the country. And uh, getting to capture their stories was a joy. I also got to watch fiber being manufactured. And that is amazing. So chapter two in this book has me scrambling around the Corning research plant in Corning, New York. I just want to say right here, right now, I have no clients, no consulting arrangements, nothing. I've got a salary from Harvard, which I'm lucky for, and I get to write for Wired, and that's it. So I'm at Corning, and uh, the reason people get so excited about fiber, let me give you a couple visual comparisons here. A quarter pound of fiber optic wires carries as much information as 35 tons of copper wire. Whoa, that's a big difference. And 
one strand of this incredibly carefully manufactured pure glass can carry all the phone calls of the world simultaneously. It's just that humans live in different places, so we need to put it geographically in different places, right? But the people, engineers would call it headroom. The information carrying capacity of fiber is, as far as we can tell, unlimited. Once you put the glass that Corning and others make in the ground, it's going to last for 40 or 50 years, and the way you upgrade it is to swap out the lasers at either end. Uh, the science is called photonics. What's happening is that lasers are being, the light is being burdened with information, effectively encoded with data, and these pulses are having gazillions of times a second. And it, because the glass is so clear and it's protected, uh, a signal can go unencouraged, unassisted for dozens of miles, right, without a boost. And that's amazing. The whole thing is amazing, and getting to see it and really talk to the engineers uh, was tremendously exciting for me. Also, I got to see it installed, um, and that was kind of fun. It, it, you get to be sort of co a combination of John McPhee and a six-year-old because they have these little tiny devices, these, like the, uh, these little trucks that ha each has their job, special job. They're like cartoon characters, and one of them is digging up the ground, by the way, much deeper than two inches uh, <laughs> to six inches or eight inches, right? They're, the standard is really nano trenching is not the way to do it, um, but micro trenching is. Um, and it works. They, they, they dig that trench, uh, lay down the wires, which have been sealed inside rubber, a fiber, and then they put asphalt over it, and then you wave goodbye for 40 years. That's it. You're done. Uh, and it gets distributed to individual houses. We have lots of fiber in America already. Uh, it runs among cities. Uh, people call that the backbone network. Some people call it middle mile. There's a big footnote here, which is that Google and Facebook all have their own networks crossing the country to serve their own data centers. Uh, we also have fiber in the uh, uh, submarine cables between continents. Another footnote. Google and Facebook have their own submarine cable fiber crossing between continents so that they can avoid any uh, surveillance or impedance caused by ne needing to depend on anybody else. Where we don't have it, and what this book is about, is what people call the last mile of the network, the very last bit of the network between your neighborhood, let's say, and your home or business. That's the real bottleneck in telecommunications policy, generally. It's the most expensive part of the network to build. And uh, right now, we're on track as a country to have maybe 11% of the fiber, 11% uh, of, of America essentially a, a, a attached to a fiber connection. Um, China, by contrast, and this is a big point of my talk today, plans to have 80% of their homes wired for fiber in short order, and they pay very low prices for it in China. It's like 10 or $20 for basically unlimited access. Uh, a month, and uh, the Belt Road Initiative, which is China's plan to build infrastructure in more than 80 countries, covering 65% of the world's population, 40% of the world's GDP. That's all underlaid with fiber. Fiber is part of all of that planning. So China, by itself as a country, accounts for 60% of the global fiber market. They're a tremendous bulk buyer of fiber. They see this as the future to generate an enormous middle class that is able to work wherever they are in new industries that don't exist yet. Uh, and China's dominance in this market means that they will have uh, strategic control potentially over what apps get to run over that network, what data is drawn for it, not just for surveillance purposes, but also for marketing. So this is a big logistics hub. You know, what if American logistics companies want to sell into companies, countries that are part of the Belt Road Initiative? It may be impossible because of the Chinese advances with their network. And then uh, Grace works on data analytics. You heard that in her introduction. That's gleaning insights from data. China making huge investments in artificial intelligence and data analytics. They'll be gleaning insights from data, yes, for surveillance purposes, but also for targeting products and services for, to be exactly when needed, as needed. It's a tremendous global advantage for them, 
And uh, a lot of the Chinese, China stuff I, I learned after I finished writing the book, and I want to give you this headline that a major American interest in this story is that we, are, we have no plan in contrast to the really very significant plans that China has. Um, I've been, over these years, over the last 10 years really that I've been working on internet access, thunderstruck by the parallels between the story of internet access in America and the story of electrification. It's almost like a bad sitcom. You can see, feel the same beats happening, you know, uh, we did this and then we did this and we did the other thing. And we're at the stage of electrification, uh, the parallel at about 1930, where people are getting the idea that electricity is a necessity, but maybe it's only for lights. They're being persuaded that you might need to use it for things like washing clothes and dishes and air conditioning and refrigeration, all these new uses, but it still feels like a luxury. And in the 30s, 90% of American farmers did not have electricity. And the entire movement to electrify the, com the country, notice, by the way, I keep messing up country and company. That's a big problem, and it's a big American problem. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, as a matter of uh, direction, electricity in America was completely controlled by a cabal of private providers who had divided up the country and said, basically, you take Minneapolis, I'll take Sacramento. And uh, we're uh, systematically wiring richer places and leaving out poorer places and, and rural places. None of this is malign on the part of the electricity companies. And I don't want you to glaze over thinking I'm going to beat up on internet access providers either. Left to their own devices, uh, the private sector will want to get quick returns as high and as fast as possible. That makes sense for them. And when it comes to something that's expensive to roll out, like electricity, uh, or in this last mile of internet access, it's just rational to, pr to pick, cherry picking it's called, uh, urban densely packed areas, especially rich ones, and businesses first. And there really isn't a business case to serve poor people, like the people in the West End of Louisville, or, or the people in rural parts of the country. There's just no reason to. So that's where we were uh, with electricity in the 30s and sort of where we are now with internet access. We're getting a little bit more advanced. What most people don't know is that the reaction to this uh, stagnant, non-competitive, expensive market for internet access was initially very local, that co-ops and cities across the country said, well, we've got to fix this problem for our people, and uh, began building their own municipal electric networks. Very brave people. Our grandparents and great-grandparents did that work. My own grandfather's first job was stringing electricity wire across the west, the, the mountains of Colorado, and then he went off and fought in World War I. You know, this was the kind of person we were producing. Um, his name was Horace, uh, and he was difficult. But that was his first job, and uh, he remembered that electrification job. Right, so here in America, when it comes to internet access, what I've been uh, really documenting is this movement also at the local level to uh, come back against what's essentially a, a very stagnant, non-competitive market for internet access by building local networks. And it's fun. It's fun to write about. It's real. It's happening quickly. And someday we'll shame the um, federal government into doing something about it. We were so excited about electricity. We get lots of phrases from that, like, that sparked my interest, or she's a live wire. Think about where these things come from. Uh, Mrs. Cornelius Vanderbilt dressed up for a fancy dress ball as electric light. And her dress is on display in New York City. You can see it. She actually had little light bulbs hidden in the dress that came out. So um, we still have that excitement. Uh, and all of that comes from the early history. We, so we sort of go through munis and co-ops, and then FDR shows up and says, why in Hot Springs is it so much more expensive to buy electricity than it is for my Hudson Valley estate? He really notices that. He understands the role of public power uh, as a, he calls it a birch rod in the closet, uh, a power of uh, localities and the government to say, we're going to oversee the provision of electricity to make sure it's delivered at reasonable rates to everybody. 
And he took on the electricity issues in the 1932 election. Electricity was the leading domestic policy issue. And FDR really felt beaten up by the electricity guys. They were so personally cruel. They lied. FDR, our most decorous president, actually said they lied in order to try to keep him out of office because, again, totally rational, wanting to protect their, the status quo, which was high prices and, and cherry picking markets. There's another parallel from a century ago that's really grabbing, grabbing my interest these days. It's, um, did you know, America we, was industrializing rapidly in the late 19th and early 20th century, but we had no banking system. We were completely primitive when it came to banking. At the time of the Civil War, on the Union side alone, there were 8,300 different forms of circulating currency. And every bank, sat on its own reserves, wouldn't help out anybody else. Uh, maybe a local bank might send its extra money to a regional bank. Regional banks might send their extra money to New York and Chicago. And then the New York and Chicago guys, this is all informal, would send their extra money to the stock market. So no liquidity, can't clear a check from one side of the country to the other without enormous help. Uh, currency completely unstable. And we had panics every three years when the whole system, this came to a crash. Some of you know this story much better than I do. Uh, the crash of 1907 was particularly awful um, because remember that excess money is flowing into the stock market, so it crashes too. Everybody loses their savings. And it took J.P. Morgan personally with his enormous nose stepping in to rescue the United States by feeding his own gold into the system. Well, at that point, we looked abroad and said, hey, there's some good ideas out there about the role of a central, a central bank might be a good idea. And we said, let's start the Federal Reserve. Now, it's at the time, the banks wanted to be overseen only by other banks. They said, only other banks would understand us, uh, much as the telecom industry would say today, only other companies would understand us, the government can't possibly. We rejected that idea, and so there may be many other things going badly in America, but we do have a functioning currency. And we do have, uh, you know, our, our deposits are insured. Uh, we don't worry that every three years the whole system will collapse. There was also a lot of anger uh, during those panics in rural areas and poor areas of the country that totally ran out of cash. It, there was a tremendous atmosphere of scarcity and real difficulty for people to keep their businesses and their lives going. Luckily, or what it, not for him, but J.P. Morgan died. That helped. And so it was clear that we needed some better system. Um, and, this, and this real resentment against the role of the big banks and their power, sort of feeling of hopelessness, launched a progressive tide in the country. And I think we're seeing some of that today in little ways. Um, and we actually, at that point, did look at what other countries did. But bottom line, it took the panic of 1907 to get Americans interested in bank oversight by the public. We had a lot of fear of central control of banking as a nation. And our parents and grandparents, who had been through things like the Great Depression, World War I, World War II, absolutely understood that the chaos and despair that happens when you let private profit taking be the only value that matters isn't worth it. And absolutely understood that things like these basic elements for functioning social and economic life, like a communications network, a banking system, clean water, clean air, only come about with oversight and intervention by the government. Today, if you even talk about oversight of telecommunications, you'll be labeled as socialist, which is so ridiculous, I can hardly stand it. Uh, it I'm, it's not about government telling you what's good for you. It's just ensuring that the basic elements of life are available at a reasonable price. And this one, infrastructure, never happens. A bridge never happens without uh, government intervention. Just a dignified life. So it turns out that capitalism needs government structures to survive. And I've really seen this over and over again working on telecom, that uh, there are lots of promises that get made. Uh, just let us be free from your cruel oversight, and we will invest more. Um, and those promises never seem to trickle down into actually lower prices for 
uh, consumers or better service because, again, totally sensible. Because it's expensive to install this last mile network, um, left to their own devices, companies doing it will just divide up markets. And we've seen this. Uh, the cable industry in most metro areas of the country has pretty much a local monopoly on high, high capacity internet access. And they called it the summer of love. In 1997, the cable industry divided up their systems. So that, uh, that's why only Spectrum is here and not both Spectrum and Comcast. And we sort of accept this now as a fact of life. Well, of course. But why did that happen? We, we let that happen because we deregulated this entire sector. Um, with our most enthusiasm about deregulation happened in uh, 2004, when we lifted all rules from high-speed internet access. Uh, without government involvement, we'll never get anywhere. So I really enjoyed learning about this history, learning, traveling around, meeting people. Something that really spurred me on was going to South Korea and Japan and uh, Sweden and Singapore and Hong Kong, places where they just assume um, very high capacity, very cheap internet access. It's just there. And uh, a line that I've repeated probably too many times is that people in South Korea told me that coming to the US was like taking a rural vacation because we're so unconnected. Things don't function. We don't have any transit. This is all, by the way, part of the same picture. And life just seems in mud for them when they come to America. And the mayor of Stockholm, this lovely woman, grabbed me by the elbow and said, how can we help? What can we do? You know, and I am really proud of being an American. I, I, I will always be proud of it. And I know that we are capable of great things. But on this one, we really are becoming a third world country. And I felt that I was in this special position because I'd been to these places and I understood the technology and could explain it. I really needed to tell this story. So it's been an honor to say, okay, look at how it works in the rest of the world and look at how it could work in the United States and what has happened. This book really is not about technology. It's much more about progressivism because it turns out that the capacity of a city or a rural co-op to think about everybody um, and make sure that this basic line reaches everybody's house is uh, connected to all kinds of other thoughts, like what are we doing about health outcomes and preventative health care? What are we doing about making sure that we have a workforce that's able to take the jobs that will show up because of the fiber network? What are we doing about transit? All these things fit together. And I, was, I began to see those signals as I spent more time thinking about, thinking about fiber. In a democracy, there really is a difference between private incentives to optimize profits and to squeeze costs out of every project, which is what Google did here. They were experimenting with making it very cheap to install fiber. And public values, and those public values are things like justice and fairness and dignity and respect and equity and all that. And we shouldn't rely on private companies for that. That's not their job. I'm not talking about the government selling internet access. I want to make this so clear you'll never forget it. I was on the phone this morning with uh, the people in Stockholm. What they did 25 years ago, they're about to celebrate their 25th anniversary, was put in what's called dark fiber. That's just the glass. It's just passive. No lights going through it. Uh, they raised money. They put out bonds uh, and put in that dark fiber gradually, incrementally, first to businesses and then to all the homes and businesses in every neighborhood. Uh, and now they lease out that publicly controlled fiber to private operators. And it's the private operators that actually put the data through the network and sell you internet access. I'm not a big proponent of government itself selling internet access, but I do think the public work, which is really what it is, of making sure that street grid is there, that blank fiber, is inherently a public responsibility. Um, and that's the way that these other countries look at it. It's just part of their industrial policy. So 25 years ago, Stockholm did that. Uh, the network more than paid for itself. And now they make money every year by leasing it out. And this is making them the sort of tech capital of Europe. Uh, many, many companies showing up. But also, uh, it's part of their overall gestalt. They, when a new neighborhood opens up, they run a transit line and a fiber network there. It's just, they're so sensible. It, your brain hurts. It's amazing. We will never be Sweden. 
We're not Sweden. I'm not arguing for that. But, you know, it's a pretty good idea <laughs> to make sure that this facility is there and it, uh, all of the private providers can then use it as an input into their uh, business. And, and our public sector, people like Grace and her colleague Mike Schnurley is here too, they need our support. They need uh, greater capacity, need to be bolstered and supported and able to stand up for themselves so that the public sector can do its job and can thrive. We've had four decades, ever since Mr. Reagan got elected, of people saying government is the problem. Well, no, not when it comes to things that are this basic, like public safety and basic infrastructure. Government's the only way it's going to happen. Otherwise, you know, why choose America? In, in China, there is no line between public and private. Uh, we have that line, and it's been important to our success, and uh, we need to hang on to it. Um, we, a big benefit is that we'll get a big, thriving digital market into which all American companies can sell. Um, so, so a few data points and then three big thoughts to leave you with, and I want to take a lot of questions if you've got them. Uh, the OECD, uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development, it developed countries, it's all the developed countries except China. They say that the U.S. is way down the list. We're number 25 out of 36 countries when it comes to fiber adoption in, 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 the, uh, in the world. The World Economic Forum ranks our digital infrastructure a dismal 27th, says we're just not ready for new industries, uh, new business of the future. We have a terrible problem. We have a sharp disagreement between the FCC and Microsoft when it comes to who's actually got internet access in America. We have terrible data that's self-reported by the carriers and sort of optimistic data saying that if a network connection is available in a census tract, we're to count the whole census tract as being served, right? Using that technique, the FCC says that only 25 million Americans uh, don't have access to 25 megabit per second download internet access speeds. That's their figure. Microsoft says, based on use of our products, we think that 168 million Americans are not using the internet at what the FCC classifies as high speeds. That's 25 megabits per second down. Um, we may be much farther behind than anyone even knows. Meanwhile, in these other countries, so uh, Asia will be the gigabit capital of the world, and that will, uh, China itself will account for something like 68% of all gigabit services. The U.S. will be more like 10 if we continue on our current trajectory. You may say to me, well, what about 5G? Isn't that going to get rid of all of our need for these stupid wires? And I will say to you, thank God you asked that question because um, 5G doesn't function without fiber. You, without a deep fiber network everywhere in the country, you won't be getting access to advanced wireless. And both the Department of Defense in a recent study and uh, Wall Street are saying that our, the U.S. plan for 5G, which involves very, very high speed frequencies, um, is going to be so expensive to build that it's very unlikely we will be able to compete in the 5G world with Asia. Um, another thing I, you should know is that, so it's complementary with fiber. It's going to be very slow to be built out and probably focus on very expensive services. That's what Verizon tells Wall Street. These will be premium services like smart city or home security, something like that. So no replacement for fiber. Um, and I've also recently become more concerned about the health effects of 5G. I'll just leave it there. But there are a lot of scientists, hundreds of them around the world, worried about having, uh, there have to be so many antennas so close to us that they may have a, a, a profound effects for human health. So there you go. Uh, I used to feel like a tin hat person when I said that, but I no longer do. I think there is something to it. And I'm also worried that the, the industry is not researching the health effects of 5G. Senator Blumenthal asked recently, is there any research about this? He asked the carriers, AT&T and Verizon, and they said, no, nothing. And he said, so we're flying blind? And they said, yep, flying blind, which is not exactly a way to run anything. Um, OK, so we have awful public data. We have no good data about prices. This all happened not as a matter of magic, but because of failures in policy. And so these books that I've been writing have been describing the sort of trail of tears that got us here. Telecom has humor, you know, it's not all deadly. And there have been funny moments, um, and they come up every once in a while. The FCC says hilarious things without even knowing it. But prices, 
prices in America are really high. That's what I want you to remember, that you might pay $10 or $25 in Asia for something here. Spectrum's advertising non-fiber service for $125 a month here in Louisville. That's insane. What? That's extraordinarily expensive. And uh, they're relying on the infrastructure that they built a long time ago, and they have the opportunity to make more money out of it. They're also, at and is offering one-year contracts. Do they do this? One of the two guys does it. And so even if they say it's 90 now, it'll go up then, um, very much so afterwards. And there's no pressure coming from either competition or oversight to cause an upgrade to fiber in that last mile at reasonable prices. The only way we're going to get there is by having a wholesale network, pro probably publicly controlled, that's blank, that allows for retail competition above it. And then, then the market really operates to encourage competition. If we expect two wires to compete with each other, they just divide markets. They say, you take these neighborhoods, we'll take these neighborhoods, and they just agree not to compete. It's happened over, this is like Lucy in the football, it keeps happening. Um, and that's a big problem. And this, so Merrill Lynch made me feel really good in February when they, they wrote that they were losing sleep over fiber. This encouraged me. They said, uh, lacking a widely diffused and low-cost fiber optics network equates to diminished growth prospects ne for nearly every U.S. economic sector and the U.S. economy in general. The book describes in each chapter how we're going to need this for everything. World-class healthcare, education, uh, working from a distance, new industries we don't expect yet. Uh, climate change plays a major role here. We should be able to work from home and not have to be on the roads all the time. Only with fibers that possible. I try to convey this to people that uh, eye contact is possible with the amount of data going over these fiber networks. True eye contact. The difference between fiber, let me try another one on you. Not only is it really lighter and carries a lot more data, but also it's like the difference between a two inch trickle of water, which you might be getting for DSL, and a 15 mile wide river. It's just a lot of data, and that's what humans need, is full bandwidth communication, really human presence is the killer app for, for fiber. And uh, a lot of these cities are, are just taking this on and uh, driving their own data networks. I spent a lot of time in Chattanooga, everybody knows that story, but also in rural Minnesota, rural California, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina was kind of a contrast. They're not taking steps, but there are hundreds <coughs> of stories out there. And it's fun, it's very American. No one ever mentions the federal government, they're just getting things done. And uh, it, it's not rocket science. It is expensive, but you can raise money to do it. And it more than pays for itself over time. Not like a media investment, not like 19% returns, but more like a gravel pit, 5 or 6% until the sun explodes. It's this very basic investment, even for the private sector. So three things, I think, are going to change our country's approach to fiber in the next few years. Uh, China, I've already mentioned, someone's going to wake up about this uh, that just massive build-out that China's making in fiber that we're not making. Another thing that's going to happen, <coughs> still looks likely to me, is recession. Uh, we seem to be, things are softening, things are slowing. I think just like that panic in 1907 and the Great Depression, we, we start focusing on what's essential and we get irritated. And the fact that so many Americans are paying such high taxes, essentially, to private companies for a basic service, is going to irritate somebody at some point. <laughs> and it already is irritating these 800 uh, places that are building their own fiber networks. And it, it will become more salient. It's just without it, you can't educate your kids. You can't, you know, you really can't join the 21st century. It's just basic for everything we want to do. And we're driving these wedges between richer urban and poor <laughs> urban, between urban and rural, and also between the United States and Asia and Northern Europe. So there, there are these gigantic crevasse-like digital divides all over the place. And someone's going to notice. Uh, I'm still looking for the senator that can speak about this effectively. If you know one, let me know. Uh, for some reason, this issue, as of yet, there's so many issues the country's confronting that it's not getting on the radar screen. If there's a reasonable presidential candidate who might like this, I would love to know. Could be a Republican. Again, there's no reason for this to be a democratic issue. It's just a basic, what's, you know, Eisenhower built the federal highway system. And the only reason he did that is that as a young guy, Eisenhower uh, had to drive across the country as a lieutenant right after World War I in a convoy of cars and trucks. 
and they kept getting stuck in the mud and it took them two months. And so Eisenhower said, well, what's up with this? We've got to have a highway system. Perfectly reasonable, moderate Republican thing to do. We need the presidential candidate who has been in that state of effectively not able to breathe with really expensive or unavailable internet access and sees it as the essential issue that it is. A third issue that really has my attention is um, climate change. And I'm, I'm personally actually making a pivot to uh, thinking about the role of local government in adapting to climate change as my next subject because uh, you really need to read a new book called The Uninhabitable Earth. The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. Each chapter, I see a couple people nodding. It's really good. It's terrifying, but you know, we live and, and read. Each chapter is about another enormous threat to the world. It's not just flooding from the river, it's also, you know, tornadoes and cyclones and pollution and fires and everything. And it's happening increasingly quickly. Our uh, uh, Pompeo just said that we're going to take over the Arctic for national security purposes, and that's where a lot of the Melting is going to happen. It's just, it's really something. And the whole country is very gradually waking up to the gigantic changes that we're facing. Duluth, Minnesota is looking really good. It's not too cold, not too hot, lots of transit, lots of apartments, so everybody take a look. Um, and the billion, there are going to be a billion or so climate refugees around the world. It's really, it's really something. So we all need high, dry, and connected places with fiber, with transit, with density. And we'll need to feel connected to people who are remote from us. So the role of fiber as part, I really can't imagine a better time to be thinking about it because we have to integrate all these systems. Moderating our use of energy, understanding how much water we waste, uh, get, having transit function, all of these things require a functioning commodity communications network and we don't really have that in the United States right now. So the fiber story is, is, should be part of that plan. The biggest mode change that gets people out of single passenger cars is not actually rapid transit. It turns out to be the ability to telecommute because people really want to be able to work from home when they can. And it's a, it's a great option. And there's some new terms I'm learning, disaster capitalism. There are people out there who want to make money from the misery that's about to happen. Um, retreat, managed retreat, is clearly necessary. It's going to take a lot of long-term planning to get there. So how on earth will future generations have a chance unless we make sure that all tr infrastructure, transit, energy, cooling, communications, water is thought through by government in a campaign of sensible planning for dry places. So if you've ever been looking for purpose in your life, try thinking about uh, climate change in a serious way. Uh, because uh, a Kennedy School student, Harvard has a Kennedy School government, a Kennedy School student, student looked at me last year and said, Professor Crawford, um, why do we need government at all? Couldn't the private sector just do everything government does just better? And, you know, he's a 20-something. It's not a rare attitude because they haven't really thought about the role of government. And one thing that kind of cheers me up is that climate is going to get everybody focused on the role of government and starting with the local government because <laughs> I've been reading up about this. The federal government has disbanded all research and thought about confronting climate refugees. And they're going to be domestic refugees as well as international ones. There's no more thinking going on about that at the federal level because we're not allowed to think about climate. Well, the cities and the local government really is thinking about that. So it takes long-term planning to deal with water. It's visceral and energy. And I just know the private sector is not going to come to the rescue. So um, this is not a technical problem. Uh, Louisville did the right thing by getting excited about fiber. Uh, the, and really the right thing by, you may not know this is a little bit of inside baseball, the city worked very hard to get uh, sensible regulation in place as a local matter to allow new providers of access to attach to poles without being beat up by the bad guys on their way in. And that was really sensible and a good thing to do. Um, what went wrong is just that this isn't inherently a private project, this basic infrastructure land. It's like, remember that bridge in um, Italy that fell down? Well, that whole function had been completely privatized. And the incentives will be in place to skirt, to cut costs. Not always, but what we really need to do is make sure that projects are overseen by the public and uh, built to a high quality standard. Um, we need better data. We need to emphasize dark fiber and open access. 
We need to make non-fiber technologies more expensive. We could use tax policy to do it. Uh, make leasing open fiber more attractive, drive demand, elect the right people. That seems important too. Not privatize the public right of way. Really think about what's public. And um, really make sure that we lower the cost of capital. We can do that through loan guarantees. And just to bring in another theme, the Fed could play an important role here there, for each region in making sure there's fiber. So it's been a great adventure for me over these 10 years, traveling around the world, talking about fiber. This happens to be the very last talk I will give about this book. And it is a delight to give it to you. And I don't do it with a sense of jadedness. I'm just as excited about this subject as I ever have been. I'm just, I'm a professor, so I get to pivot. And I get to work on something new. And for me, the science in climate really seems like the most important thing that I can learn about and the role of government in making sure that people are safe. So I'm going to go do that. But now I just want to say thank you and ask for your questions and comments. So thank you. Very nice. Yes. Uh, no, no thoughts on that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Can you tell me about it? What's, what's in it? Uh, it's very similar to the $7 billion allocated. For oh, oh, but this is for rural. Yes. Right. My, my, okay, yeah, I am focused on that. In, I just didn't know what it was called. I, I worry that uh, we sort of say to ourselves as a country, oh, we're going to give some second-rate networks to those rural people and just, you know, comfort them, when actually the whole country, including poor people and pe people of color in urban places, needs much better internet access. That we're deluding ourselves if we think this is a rural issue. Uh, fiber is as different from what we think of as internet access as having electricity is different from not having it. It's a phase change, not a difference in kind. And there's no reason why rural people should have second class network access, none at all. And there's no reason why anybody in America, frankly, should not have cheap, ubiquitous internet access. We did this for the telephone. We're perfectly capable of doing it. We just haven't done it for internet access. So for me, it's, it, it just doesn't go far enough and doesn't take seriously our global disadvantage for failing to focus on this issue. Yeah, the way, way back. Yes? You said you uh, have over company and Oh, yeah. Oh, I wanted to come back to that. You know, I think this is part of losing the sense that there's a difference between public and private. And actually, there's a role for seeing yourself as a country with values of equity and fairness and decency and respect, and not as a company focused on just profit among, as the only thing we care about. And it sounds old-fashioned even to say it, right? And I think this confusion between country and company is pretty fundamental, and I catch it in my students all the time. You, you've got to recognize there's a difference. And you know, we love it that com companies get to make money. That's fine. But that's not the only value we care about. Yes? How has the practice of dividing up communities uh, between providers not considered monopolistic behavior? Why is that not? Good question. Yeah, both the FCC and the Department of Justice collaborated, essentially, with this collusion, if you want to use a popular word, uh, to, to divide up because it's economically rational for them to do it. So, for example, a failing uh, cable company, family held called Adelphia, fell apart in Philadelphia, and <clears throat> its systems were divided between Comcast and what is now Spectrum and another company, and that was a filing made with the FCC. Because then the, the customers could continue to be served, and then the, it, it just totally makes sense from a private point of view. You get to spread your costs very effectively over a single geographic area and have the whole of market rather than engaging in what the railroad barons would have called ruinous competition. But it precludes um, any pretense of consumer choice. So, right. you know, you can't right. choose between and Trader Joe's and Aldi and whoever nope. provides all your food. No. Nope. Um, they just divide up the market. And the, the legal response was, in, since 1992, it has been illegal to have a stated exclusive franchise for cable in any, any city. But de facto, we have uh, exclusive franchises everywhere. 
And there are all kinds of ways to spin the needle. I mean, uh, apartment houses, I have an apartment in New York, and they usually have just one choice because the carriers decide who's going to serve that building. And, and also, uh, there's a, something you should know about. 5% of video fees of, uh, that are paid to the carrier, like uh, Comcast or Spectrum, go back to the city. So that's a tremendous conflict of interest not to rock the boat, not to interfere with that stream of revenue, which is used for really good things, often used to close the digital divide. So if you're a city strapped for resources in an atmosphere where no one cares about you and incredible austerity, you're going to hang on to every buck you can. And if part of that is the cable franchise fee, you're not going to mess it up. So that, and when I told that to the people from Denmark, they said, what? You know, they were really surprised. Uh, you have money flowing back to the city government? How does that work? And it's just, it was built in from, it was a way to sort of get everybody on board with the system. So, isn't this fun? Telecom is fun. Yeah, I'm going to go over there. Has there been a successful city that has, uh, success has, reserved, that has been able to uh, lay fiber successfully with the government? Yeah, actually hundreds in America, um, often based on pre-existing municipal electric relationships. Not using the same wires, but if you have a public electric company in your city, you've got a big leg up because you have relationships with the customers, you have people who are used to dealing with lines and connections, and there are hundreds of places in the United States that have built fiber networks based on those municipal electric places. Yeah, and very successfully, and they make money. They may not make enough money for uh, you know, like a Verizon, which calls itself a media company these days, but they make money. They're profitable. So, yeah. You, you were going to say why uh, Google left Louisville. Yeah. Did, did I miss it or did you say it? <laughs> Well, uh, I guess the larger lesson is here. If um, there, Verizon and Google initially started off with big fiber plans, both companies. And got, you know, they had leaders who were quite excited about the potential of fiber. Wall Street didn't like it for either company because it is high upfront costs and the returns come in slowly. And so it's the investors in both public investors who said, why are you doing this? This isn't what we do. Go find sectors of your business that are more profitable. So Verizon in 2010 announced it was backing out of installing Fios, no more neighborhoods. And it hasn't really gone back since because the CEO, Ivan Seidenberg, really liked the fiber plan, but the investors didn't. Uh, same thing happened with Google. Uh, initially, they were very playful about it. When they announced, I remember this happening in 2010, 2011, we're going to be Google cities, like tremendous enthusiasm, balloons and animals and everything. <laughs> and then their investors, especially after Alphabet was spun off and became its own thing, were not that enthusiastic about it. They said, let's go for other high risk, high reward goals. So they have now invested $2 billion in autonomous vehicles. That's the Waymo division of, of Alphabet. And they plan to be very dominant in autonomous vehicles. And they just decided, you know, fiber's not our, our game. And I think Louisville fell victim to that. There had been a pause announced several months uh, in the fall of 20, get the dates right, 2016, October 2016, Google said, we're gonna pause. And everybody kind of froze. And then they said, well, maybe, they said in February 2017, maybe we'll try uh, sort of fiber 2.0. And, and then Louisville fell on that list. And, but they wanted to do it really cheaply. Um, and, and basically, I think it was a larger strategic determination by Google that this didn't make sense. And so they, first they tried to squeeze costs. And then clearly, the nano trenching was a failure. And then they said, well, uh, we're out of here. So do they have a lot of hardware? Uh, they have repaid the city um, their uh, franchise owed fees for, for doing that and uh, made the city whole. But yes, they walked away. Yeah. So you, you said that you do not advocate for a municipality to, do, to provide internet service. Itself, yeah. Yeah, itself. Actually, it's worth noting that you surprised you, I agree with you. Um, you mentioned dark fiber. Yeah. In your thoughts on the middle ground of maybe providing a municipal uh, data network, a lit network, yeah. but within the city. Within this is pretty technical, folks. It just yeah, means sorry. having one layer up uh, in terms of control. 
I'm kind of a purist. I love the idea of just keeping the government out of it be, uh, because people get really spooked about surveillance and privacy and everything else, and it's just so much easier not to be the provider of that lit. There are cities in America who've done that. Ammon, Idaho is a very famous example that they have a lit network and then they let people compete over that. I just, I want to draw this comparison to a public work, which I think people still get, almost, I hope they get it, that <laughs> there is something about this, why we have a postal service, we have bridges, you know, that these, they have spillover effects that are very positive for the private sector. But the thing itself, the basic grid, is a public function and needs to be publicly overseen. And that's the only way it really works. Way in the back. I was wondering, um, do you favor uh, freedom for Assange and Chelsea Manning? And what can we do to stop the deplatformization of uh, sites that are, shall we say, outside of the uh, official circle? Well, here I'm going to claim my professor of prerogative and say, I am so close to the dirt in these issues, I don't want to get into content. And that's why I get all excited about just talking about infrastructure and not content. So I don't have a view about Mr. Assange or, or Bradley Manning or Chelsea Manning. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned a few times about how policy is stopping us from doing all yep. this. What can I do as just a regular citizen to help this? You can give your uh, city employees air cover and uh, help them when they want to do something brave the next time. This is all about electing the right people who care about this issue, making sure it's in every debate, every elected official should understand it, and when the city wants to be courageous, then give them support, support them, and make sure that young people go work for government and just change the generations. That's your obligation. It's actually, you can't geek around this. This is about electing people and supporting them. It's really basic block and tackle government stuff. Satellite, 22,000 miles up, it really causes a delay and is not a satisfying substitute for the kind of system I'm talking about. That being said, the FCC is issuing a bunch of licenses for what they call low Earth orbit satellites, which may have interesting results for all this, but I'm still maintaining that there is no substitute for this unbelievable technology when it's in the ground reaching everywhere. We're not going to find anything better than this for the next 40 or 50 years. Thank you.